Zad Sayhan at present is the Fairbank Professor in the Humanities, Professor of German and Comparative Literature, Affiliated Faculty in Philosophy and Middle East Studies at Bern Mar College. She is the author of a host of publications, including Representation and its Discontents, uh, The Critical Legacy of German Romanticism, the seminal Writing Outside the Nation, and also Tales of Cross Destinies, the modern Turkish novel in a comparative context. She has published and lectured extensively on German idealism and romanticism, critical theory, exile narratives, Turkish-German literature, and the theory of the novel. She's also the recipient of a series of academic awards, recognizing her excellence in both research and in teaching, including recently the Lindbeck Foundation Award in 2009, and the National Endowment for the Humanities Fellowship for the American Research Institute in Hungary. Azade Seyhan, simply put, is one of the most significant and emblematic theoretical pillars of transnational studies today. Her scholarship brings together a razor-sharp mind with a sensitivity and empathy towards her subjects of study, exceptionally modern-day literary studies. In her book, Writing Outside the Nation, she not only has established the parameters for a genuinely new discourse of transnationalism, but she also remained stubbornly focused on the subject of her study, literature. In her introduction to that work, she has argued that every theory of transnational literature is most convincingly articulated and performed by works of literature and art themselves. This way of approaching texts has remained at the center of Azade's scholarship. Whether writing about Chicano, Chicana, or Turkish German works, she creates a space for the texts themselves to speak offering theoretical frameworks that withstand the stormy changes of scholarly discourse. Although Azade Sayhan's ideas have defined the terms of theoretical discourse, this is done in the context of a dialogic relationship with the reader. The best testimony uh, of this is this conference, which has brought together over 50 scholars who, in one way or another, are all in conversation with Azade's paradigm-shifting ideas. We therefore consider ourselves extremely fortunate that Azade Sahin accepted our invitation and honored us with her presence in Budapest. Today she's going to delve into ideas of censorship, exile and translation in her talk entitled Crossing Borders in Perilous Zones, Labors of Transport and Translation in Women Writers of Exile. So please welcome Azade Sahin. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers of this conference. It, I know what it takes to organize something like this, and I think you just did an absolutely fantastic job. Uh, thank you so much, Yasmina. We have been <laughs> emailing each other for so long, and Barbara for this incredibly generous introduction by which I'm very humbled, actually. Thank you. And thank you all for coming. Um, I actually would like to start with a quote from a novel called Breath, Eyes, Memory by Haitian writer Edwidge Danticat. She says, I come from a place where breath, eyes, and memory are one, a place from which you carry your past like hair on your head where women return to their children as butterflies or tears in the eyes of the statues that their daughters pray to. These lines toward the end of Edwidge Danticat's thinly veiled autobiographical novel, Breath, Eyes, Memory, stand as testimony to the urgency of remembering when exile and displacement create a sense of permanent loss. In an age of unprecedented scale of human movement, Within and without national borders, questions of belonging, exclusion, otherness, hybrid idioms, and the need for cultural translatability confront us with increasing urgency. The cross currents of diverse cultures in today's so-called globalized world, their different ports of entry and their multiple destinations, shape and reshape our notions of critical inquiry and demand very different and appropriate strategies of reading. Neither post-colonial theory nor discourses of identity politics can address the diversity and complexity 
of diasporic narratives that emerge from transit points between languages, cultures, and belief and value systems, and therefore resist classification. The vertigo of separation from language, transit, and displacement thrust the subject into stutter, if not complete silence. The first signs of emergence from silence appear in the autobiographical writings of women in exile. Some of these writings I have actually called autoethnographies uh, in a different context. Exile autobiographies, be they veiled or revealed, emerge as a scriptable voice in the space of silence and function as a form of anamnesis recoverable in imagination. Autobiography always entails self-translation, and autobiography in a second language is double translation. As writing affords access into a past necessarily erased by traumas of dislocation, it rises to the challenge of speaking beyond the episteme of mere otherness. Women writing outside the nation sound the silences of memories scattered in the shuffle of histories of displacement and persecution. In Dante Cat's memory, the past survives, but in transfigured form. Women as butterflies, stars or larks, the living as ghosts, French as Creole, and lived experience as a recurring nightmare. Writing is silent, but it becomes audible in self-translation. What silences voices even before any experience of displacement and exile is censorship in the exile's own country. What is of critical interest to me at this point is the contiguity of censorship, exile, and translation. Many writer is driven into exile because of censorship in her country. However, once in exile, she can often regain her voice in translation or self-translation. Samar Attar, a Syrian writer born in Damascus, but has lived in Canada, Germany, Algeria, Turkey, and the United States, writes that she started to self-translate because she had a hard time getting her novel, Lina, a portrait of a Damascene girl, written in Arabic, originally published. She sees the act of self-translation as a, quote, response to continuous attempts to stifle and silence my voice as a novelist. The act of self-translation has made me visible and has given me a voice which I was denied as a writer in Arabic. Self-translation also helps her to keep her Arabic language alive, but overall, quote, Censorship was, and still is the reason, that forced me to use translation as a strategy to assert my voice as a writer. Discouraged by the continuing repression she has suffered, Attar saw her future as a writer in producing books in translation, quote, both to a readership of expatriate Arabs living in the West, as well as the Western reader, unquote. Attar adds that she translates her own work not out of vanity or as an exercise in bilingualism a la Samuel Beckett, but in response to continuous attempts to stifle and silence her voice as a novelist. And if she succeeds in producing a good translation, she owes this in no small measure to the censors. This always reminds me of what German poet Heinrich Heine, living in Parisian exile, is known for his despairing comment. He said, but how am I ever going to be able to write again upon hearing that censorship on writing was lifted in his native Germany? The condition of real exile or enforced exile not chosen or temporary exile, because I'm in a chosen exile, so I don't want to romanticize the situation of the exile all the time. But the real exile, uh, that is a result of persecution or um, any you know, political persecution, a very dire econ economic necessity, and so on, places 
an existential and even a metaphysical burden on certain dimensions of human experience, including language, history, community, and resistance against erasure of identity and memory. While language needs to be forged and kept alive for a community, that community often only exists in memory. Thus, Attar's choice to write in English, in English translation for the Arab expatriotic community in the West. In translation, pain and loss and cultural idioms and practices under erasure are transformed into a consolation of remembrance, and sometimes more than that. When writers write in a language not their own, they write usually in and as translation, be this literal, metaphorical, or cultural. While the symbolic force of the original may not come across in its entirety, translation reveals, as Walter Benjamin, in his, of course, by now, iconic essay called The Aufgabe des Übersetzers, The Task of the Translators, what was unsayable in the original. The repressed, what was repressed in the original language could be many different things. It could be an overextended idiom that had lost its currency, as in Nietzsche's metaphor of the overuse of a word or metaphor resulting in the loss of its exchange value like coins which had lost their currency because the images on them were erased in time by overuse. Nietzsche is one of the first philosophers who actually makes this connection between the exchange value of language and the exchange value of money, obviously. Or the repressed could be a, a history under erasure that then reclaims a new life in translation. This messianic character of translation, Derrida remarks, referring to Benjamin's essay, quote, uh, is not a result of translation success because a translation never succeeds in the pure and absolute sense of the term. Rather, a translation succeeds in promising reconciliation, unquote. It also reconciles the self-translating writer with what had muted her speech in her original language. The roster of writers in exile and writing in the language of the host country has steadily grown in the last decades. Of course, Algerian writers have formed the avant-garde on the list, among them Asya Jabbar, about which we heard yesterday, uh, Yasmin Kadra, who by the way is a man <laughs> and was actually an officer of the Algerian army, but writes under the pseudonym of his wife's name, Yasmin Kadra, and Tahir Dajout, who actually was assassinated by the fundamentalists, although he was in uh, France, writing his last book, um, who not only write in French, but also use their translated language to articulate truths censored in both the private and the public spheres. Among the lists are also writers such as Shahriar Mandanipur and Mariana Satrapi of Iran, whose works could only be written in exile and in translation and in self-translation or duplicate translation. This is actually a wonderful uh, novel, Censoring an Iranian Love Story. This is the cover of the novel. Um, it's, of course, a very metafictional novel and kind of um, what my son calls the literary parlor games. Um, and um, so he's also a literary critic, by the way. And so the, the way this novel is written, and I was teaching this in a censorship class, it's the, he never wrote this novel. I mean, he probably scribbled it on a paper, but he couldn't publish it in Iran. And he writes, he shows what the censor actually kept censoring. And this is the way the whole novel is. But in a way, you can read what it is, but it's just striked. And so you know what actually the censors uh, did strike. And, and it's also incredibly funny, like uh, there's a censor, he is actually, he does this, he censors films, but he's blind. So the, of course, he could not publish something like this actually in Iran, and the, the book was never published in Iran, and it's only in translation. So this, this book also uh, 
belongs to the category of translation without an original. So we have a new category. Um, and I think everybody knows Mariana Satrapi's Persepolis. Uh, I find that a kind of a, a narcissistic account, but it is actually a personal account of the reign of terror of uh, Islam, Iran's Islamic regime. She, of course, got a lot of mileage out of it. They made the film, and Catherine Deneau voice and her daughter were dubbing the film and so on. So, but in a way it was kind of interesting because it's uh, also a translation into words and um, into visual form. Now I would like to supplement this very brief overview of the conceptual field by viewing the actual experience of translation, self-translation and intercultural translation Looking very briefly at the work of Emine Sevgi Özdemar, who after immigrating to Germany from Turkey began writing in NS translation, in other words, in German translation of her native language. Uh, this is her, um, uh, well these are, what I find interesting is also book covers, you know, the original German and then the, the English translation here. So in the case of writers whose work was or may have been banned in their own land and language, a salient feature of such self-translation is the liberation of the repressed language, which is a, becomes a form of uh, anti-cathexis that not only releases the energies of the source language as expression, but also enhances the target language as the German romantics envisioned it. There's a line in um, Özdemar's collection of short stories called Die Mutterzunge, the mother tongue, uh, in which she says, in der Fremdsprache haben Wörter keine Kindheit. In the foreign language, words have no childhood. This always struck me as very true, but what she does in her work is completely the opposite. In fact, she looks for her childhood in the foreign language. Why Germany? Um, since the end of the Cold War, the reunited Germany has been an active site of fiery debates where stakes in immigration, patriation, and national and ethnic identity politics are very high. Approximately seven million residents of non-German origin are now permanently settled in Germany. Close to three million of them are Turkish Germans. Three generations of women of Turkish ancestry have experienced the challenges of living as doubly exiled in Germany. Women migrants comprise the majority of the global workforce and are also the greatest dispensable resource of multinational firms. They're confined to a cultural vacuum, often separated for years from their families and children and trapped in jobs and social contexts that offer no security. From the ashes of their former homes have, in some cases, arisen narratives that herald a pioneering aesthetics of women writers and filmmakers and aesthetics forced from their experience of exile, which in turn was necessitated by fear of persecution and censorship in their home countries. Their work articulates the relationship between censorship, exile, and translation, and at the same time, stands as a very eloquent testimony to issues of loss, witness, and identity. While translation necessarily involves an arguably enriching change in an exchange between individuals and communities, it also awakens innate and often subconscious fears of invasion and impurity, a telling example of such deep-rooted anxiety of being overrun by the foreign is a fairly recently coined German word, Überfremdung, which literally means over-foreignization. In response to the large number of people from non-Western countries who have settled in Germany during the last decades, it is perhaps no coincidence that the German word for translation, Übersetzung, not only rhymes with Überfremdung, but also reason sounds almost like it. At the same time, the German verb Übersetzen, to translate, has also the double meaning of transport, translate and transport, 
depending on whether the verb is used as separable or inseparable. The coincidence of these two meanings of translation and transfer is of course not unique to German and their linkage and extension and by extension the relationship of translation to migration, movement and displacement is not necessarily a recent trope. The anthropologist Talal Asat, who has extensively treated the concept of cultural translation and other translation theorists have pointed out that in ecclesiastical usage, the transfer of a saint's remains or relics from their original site to another one was also called translation. In medieval Christendom, narratives pertaining to this transfer were called translaciones. The translaciones showed that the relics endowed the new site with enhanced significance. Therefore, the translatio could never be a value-free representation. And in addition to endowing the new site with power, it was also recited as liturgy at the anniversary of the completed transfer. The contradictory meanings embodied in the concept of translation in diverse languages underscore the view that the association of translation with migration generates both hope for change but also fear of invasion, death, and contagion, überfremdung. With the escalation of movements across borders, differences have become more visible, and the role of the translator in negotiating different linguistic and cultural idioms has also become increasingly important. In this context, writing transnationally, plurilingually, or as self-translation, <clears throat> resists the power of censors and control over linguistic heterogeneity. Özdemar, a first-generation Turkish writer, writes in German that, as her second and third language is already a translation. She's one of the best-known non-native writers of Germany, the poster girl of women writers in, uh, of non-German descent. But there's something very strange about her. Almost every American woman graduate student getting a PhD in German literature nowadays, every doctorantin is actually writing her dissertation on Ibn Sabia Özdemar. I mean, everyone has forgotten Goethe and Schiller. I'm not very happy about it, frankly, because a lot of these dissertations come my way and I don't know what to do with them. <laughs> she's one of the best known non-native writers of Germany, but she's also a novelist and a playwright and a stage director, and she's also a movie actress and has received numerous awards, including the prestigious Ingeborg Bachmann, prize in 1991 for this book actually, which was actually at the time unpublished. And she just read it like you were reading you know, her work yesterday, where yours was published. Um, so das Leben ist eine Karawanserei, hat zwei Türen. Aus einer kam ich rein und aus der anderen ging ich raus. This is actually really a Turkish proverb, which means uh, life is a caravanserai, and I came in through one door and I went out through the other. And it was the first time that the prize was awarded to a writer whose native language was not German. Now, while at the same time, not a few critics raised the question of whether the prize was awarded for reasons of political correctness. Özdemar has since gained considerable critical cachet, especially among American scholars of German literature. Although Orientalist readings of Caravanserai were commonplace, some touched upon an important point Goethe had articulated and early German romantics had observed, which is translation enriched and expanded the target language, regenerated it not only on the cu cultural and social level, but also, as Goethe said, in its own speaking. Özdemar's conscious translation of the metaphorical world of Turkish into an exoticized German was seen as a picturesque transformation of German. What is always not evident, and I think purposefully not so, is that translation says what may be unsayable, repressed, or censored in the original. It reveals something that censorship or fear of persecution holds back or hides. At times, Özdemar's work reads like a compact archive of censored stories smuggled across borders in translation. While any mention of her ethnic origins is either a veiled or a fleeting illusion, illusion in Özdemar, uh, she's actually of Kurdish origin, her skating criticism of the persecution of political dissidents in Turkey, but also in Germany, is unmistakable 
though couched in very black humor. While the linguistic innovations Özdemir has introduced into German through her ingenious translation of Turkish infuses German with a picture-like quality, the endurance of her work rests on issues that have a larger appeal beyond the exoticism of Turkish-German remix. Her histories and stories preserve and reveal banned chapters of uh, modern Turkish history, put Turkish and German pasts into a kind of an open dialogue, and retell suppress or forgotten tales that help decipher the apparently inscrutable signs of other cultures. These cultures are not necessarily and not ne always and not necessarily marked by geographical space and national, ethnic, or religious affiliation. They can also refer to historical distance, alternative and counter modes of life in any given place, and islands of speech patterns or community memory. In choosing to translate their histories and stories into the language of the hostland, many writers in exile hold the censors at bay, or they restate what was censored, either by censors or even through self-censorship in the protective membrane of translation. Özdemir's experience of political persecution in her country, her witnessing of what practically amounted to a civil war between the Turkish state and the Kurdish insur insurgency, which is still going on, caused the linguistic amnesia recovered only in translation. She uh, reportedly was afflicted by a condition that prevented her from using her native language. So the translation candled the story of a traumatic past indirectly, without necessarily taking away from the power of that experience. She has used translation as a self-censoring tool to both comic and devastating or devastatingly comic effect. In one of her stories in her collection, Mutterzunga, the narrator recalls seeing in the prison where she was held the brother of a young man tortured to death during a police interrogation. She remembers how many such young men and women were repeatedly arrested and jailed by brutal police forces who, quote, pumped out the milk that their mothers breastfed them through their noses, unquote. She's written this in German, of course. Man hat ihnen die Milch, die sie aus ihren Müttern getrunken haben, aus ihrer Nase herausgeholt. In the translation of this idiom, the brutality of the event is actually really masked because the meaning cannot be conveyed in its nakedness and has almost an absurd or comical effect as it suggests a medical procedure really like pumping the stomach after food poisoning. In Das Leben ist eine Karavanserei, Özdemir tells the translated and simultaneously self-censored history of an earlier regime of oppression and that was 1950-60 when a Democratic Party, the party was called Democratic Party, came to power with the first actually really democratic elections, but soon they became very corrupt, of course, backed by uh, the CIA and the American government. And, and, and it was a terrible last five or six years. She witnesses this as a child uh, in very fragmented experiences of her immediate world, of her family, and of the many towns where her father had found temporary employment. She reconfigures these shards of memory in a narrative that's complemented by banned or contraband books, as well as other sources in Turkish and German archives. And that actually resists an external sensorial intervention. At the same time, in the German context, her stories gain resonance by her ability to read them against German memories in the juxtaposition of these parallel national pasts, Turkish and German, she sees a repeating trauma, which can only be brought to a level of consciousness in writing and in her own translation. So this translation for her represents a virtual traveling library. So a translation for her, this is her metaphor, it's a traveling library, a bookmobile, what, that accompanies the peripatetic writer, Özdemar herself, who checks out volumes of Heine and Marx and Engels, Nietzsche and Brecht, and translates against the larger narrative of German political history these texts provide her with, also Turkey's trials with modernity and the trauma of German modernity itself. Narrative memory that is powerfully linked to trauma confronts the theft of history 
and writing enables alternative remembrances and histories to emerge. The work of commemoration remains the only access to forgotten and erased stories and pasts. Remembering, the wonderful English word re-membering, putting the members together, shards and fragments of memory is a process of translating the imperfect past into a present progressive. Now, translation opens up a terrain where critical stakes concerning the future of an increasingly globalized world with its attendant problems will be played out. These critical stakes focus on such questions as under what conditions does a more powerful culture or a high status language dominate the lesser known culture or low status language? Um, Walter Benjamin's, um, uh, uh, the task of the translator is just such a mystifying uh, little article, everyone reads it differently, but I read it as uh, he sees in translation actually an equalizing factor of, of two languages. So that, you know, you're not really translating from a high status language into a low status or vice versa. Um, so will we imagine, so we ask all of these questions and who's going to translate the migrant? the iconic protagonist of our age. Like several other critics, I find the term migrant actually quite problematic because it has connotations of transient and it implies a threat to established communities. It also appears to define only those writers coming from a lesser culture or from a poorer background. I mean, no one has ever called the American expatriate writers in Paris migrant writers. And English writers, wherever they write, are never called migrant writers. So that, that work, migrant writer, really has that kind of connotation that you only relate to, quote, unquote, lesser cultures. So will the imagined decline, and this is my last, will the imagined decline of the nation state render linguistic identity obsolete and make translation the norm? In an ideal or futuristic world where the nation state and its sovereign power are no longer the norm and we all live in translation, so to speak, our languages and differences will no longer be sites of competition and conflict. But in the not so real and in the not so ideal world of realpolitik, where millions have been forced out of the comfort zone of their own languages, translation becomes a possible path, however fraught at times, to negotiation of difference. Political implications at the intersection of migration and translational activity resonate in the work of some of the major critics of our time. Michel Foucault's work has shown us how governments and regimes monitor every aspect of human, human lives through a close control of all institutional structures. It is through what he calls biopower, the impact of political power on all aspects of life that governments regulate populations. If the surge in dislocated populations becomes a problem for biopolitical power, then translation as an institution, if we can consider it such, will also become under the panoptic management of seats of political power. In the final analysis, translation marks an entry point into another language and culture. It also implies disassembling and reassembling language. In every reassembly, there's a danger of a gap caused by parts that may be missing or are misaligned. These gaps can be read as sites of irreducible untranslatability, but they can also be placeholders for emergent idioms that defy censors. Ultimately, how we assembled our versions of the self, translate ourselves, lie at the core of our identity, our forms of being and seeing, and facing the brave new world. The tales of these transnational Shehrazads recover the centrality of fiction and self-translation to our understanding of how cultures get interpreted as they move from geography to geography and generation to generation. Thank you. This is actually the Mobile Library, and this is the end. <laughs> Very much for this wonderful and really stimulating talk. I'm right. sure you are 
first I want to thank you for uh, your lecture. It's uh, very amazing and actually very useful for me since I'm writing my... Could you speak? Um, Hold on, I see. Uh, Isn't there a mic? Yes. Please can you just take one mic. Not that one, the other one. The other. Yes, <laughs> I want to thank you for your lecture since um, it was very amazing and it's very useful for me. I'm writing my thesis right now, which is related to this topic. Right. Uh, my question is in relation to this, um, to translation, but you talked about uh, the self-translation and then uh, writing in the second language. Uh, I want to ask about uh, the translation uh, of a migrant autobiography to another language, the third language, by, by a third person. Uh, what, what's happening in this situation? For example, I'm talking about uh, Marjana Satrapi's autobiography, which is written in French, which is already her second language. Mm -hmm. And it is translated to English by another person. So yeah. it, this uh, intercultural translation without uh, the writers intervention. Yeah, without the writer's intervention. I'm very glad you asked that question because I was going to actually explain something about this. So, so there are actually two kinds of self-translation. One would be like this, uh, uh, the Arabic writer Atar, the, the Syrian writer. She actually writes first, she actually writes her fir first, she writes it in English, I mean in Arabic. So that's her native language, if we can even use the word native anymore. Everything has become extremely loaded, every word. Uh, so, uh, she, so she writes that, and then she, uh, for practical reasons, she self-translates. But that shouldn't probably be called self-translate, but to translate herself. There's kind of a difference there. Uh, I think Özdemar self-translates. Uh, that is to say, she is in, in she is in her mind only. It's some kind of a just a mental translation, not a physical on paper translation, but definitely translating from uh, uh, Turkish in her case because it sounds Turkish even though it's written in German, right? Uh, and then the third person, uh, actually going back uh, here, here. Okay, so. She, this is really a self-translation, and then a third person translates that. So it was without her intervention, actually. So that happens very often, too, because that's the only way. So there's a triple translation, if you will. And, and that's the only way for the distribution of these works. Because a work like, I mean, how many people really in, 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 in the United States today speak German? Very few. Mm -hmm. uh, but but this, this book was important for uh, you know, my great, whatever, you know, diaspora studies or, or exile studies because that topic is, is always au courant, you know, in, in, in the American landscape because it sees itself as a country of immigrants. The situation in Europe is, of course, very different. European countries are, uh, Germany always calls itself, we are not a land of immigration. But there are books like this, and then of course a lot of these books written in French by Algerian writers or, you know, um, Maghrebi writers have always also been translated into English for a wider audience and maybe even other languages. I think one of them was in fact perhaps translated into, um, oh, there's one of them was actually translated into German. So what happens, what happens is something either gets lost in translation, to use a very banal metaphor, uh, but also um, what happens with translation, uh, the, uh, so it's not only a geographical difference, you know, there are historical differences in translation. When the, the Bible that was translated by Luther is a very different Bible in German translation when it was later translated when the Nazis were coming to power by Rosenzweig, uh, Franz Rosenzweig, that's a very different Bible, although it's, it's a translation into the same High German. But there was something in that other translation which reflected the growing fear of the Nazis or, and so on. So, so it's not only a geographical difference uh, in these double, triple translations, it's also a historical 
difference. And that's what's happening. Uh, I just uh, a, a quick question. So as a researcher who is reading these autobiographies are of two different writers that both has been translated to English, one German, one French, and they are both Iranian. The original language was in Farsi. Farsi. I should reflect on this limitation as I only have access to the trans English translation of these right. two because, autobiographies. Because, because, uh, are you talking about a translation without an original? Is that what you're saying? Um, yes, you and also mean? about this uh, triple translation that yeah. the only thing I have access to, yes. Definitely, exactly. because it doesn't the have the origin. The only thing you have access to, because maybe these books are not available in Iran, let's say, you only have access to uh, a translation. And also remember that any translation has a temporal gap also. Even if they were written, you know, translated in the same, same within a month even. And you, translation is, is always a representation. And representation, again, using the English notion, is always a representation, presenting something again, which means there's a temporal gap. And you have to, I think, reflect on that too. Thank you. Get another question. Apologies Thank you for talking into the mic. Here comes. Here is oh, oh, I actually. Oh. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you. Thank you for a wonderful talk. I immensely enjoyed it. Um, you mentioned Yasmina Khadra, which I thought was kind of raised a question for me because I wondered, first of all, kind of general question is translation always about the recuperation uh, or the kind of the ability to find freedom in order to narrate repressed? political histories, uh, traumas, etc. Can it also work problematically in a different way? Because I was thinking of Hadra in particular and like his crime fiction set in, in Algeria and his reception in France where writing in France, writing being published by Gallimard, um, everyone at first thinks it's a woman, doesn't realize it's a, a male yeah. pseudonym, goes, what a wonderful recuperation of women's experience when these texts are actually intensely misogynistic in my own reading. Um, women don't get to speak, his wife is basically a silent vessel, they're intensely masculinist, and the kind of historical amnesias that they're uncovering while they are dealing with many of the massacres and the disappearances during the 90s in Algeria and the Civil War, they are like totally erase the role of the security services and, the, and the, the military with which he was involved while uncovering other things and blaming a lot of it on Islamo-fascism. So for me, translation there ended up serving and consecrating Hadra in a kind of Parisian and then an American market because because it served particular discourses. So I'm just asking, you know, are there counterexamples? Because I absolutely loved your reading of Ozdemar and Danticat and these other writers who are absolutely using this in this very liberating way. But can it also play to market logic? Well, okay, I mean, I think you're right because there's that whole uh, history of his being in the army and so on, and, and perhaps he may have been complicit, you know, in certain things. I'm not quite sure if I read him really as a, misogynistic writer, and I'm thinking, I mean, the first book I read of his was actually The Swallows of Kabul, where I think he, it, and, and I was very fascinated by the, the, the character, the woman who had to be, uh, um, she was a lawyer, and, and, and a lawyer fighting for women's rights, and, and he has given her some very powerful lines, actually, you I'm know. I'm thinking more of the kind of 80s and 90s fiction, Inspector Logue and all those things before Swallow. Well, I have to say, I mean, I don't really know about his past all that much, you know, he's really, uh, but, but, uh, okay, and, you know, I also have an issue myself coming from a secular Turkey and seeing what's happening to it right now. And I think he's also giving voice to, to the frustration of certain secular daughters of the, <laughs> of the Republic. And, uh, and also in, in teaching, the, um, there's, there's, there's a place in which I actually um, compare him with Orhan Pamuk, where uh, or Hampomok only in snow, for example, tries to get into the fundamentalist mind. And I think this is actually a very good thing to do because, you know, you don't have to demonize uh, these people. And in the attack, 
he, he does that also, you know, tries to get into the mind of the wife who becomes a suicide bomber. I don't think he's demeaning her. So, um, so in a way, I see to a certain extent, I'm not a fan of Pamuk at all, but, uh, but, but there are certain actually, uh, in that particular work, he tries to understand both sides. And I think uh, the Swallows of Kabul was a very anti, you know, Islamic, but not necessarily anti-Islamic as a whole. It was what was happening in Afghanistan, you know, to women, really. So um, it's, it's a matter of um, interpretation. You know, I, I have not really, I haven't read all of his work, you know. He's sort of a footnote, you know, in my presentation, so I cannot say he's a misogynist reader. But, and there's also probably also a repressed past. Well, you can do two things. I think you're right. You can repress also an ugly past in translation. Or you can also reveal and a liberating one. Time, yeah. you and in time, yeah. All right, oh, thank sorry. you for this uh, wonderful, mind blowing talk. I'm I, sorry about hitting uh, you at the restaurant the other day. <laughs> I don't even know. <laughs> I was the one who hit you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for telling me. <laughs> I was oh, really, yeah, I, I really like your point about this irreducible untranslability, and I was thinking about, you know, certain, uh, you know, transnational fictions. You know, once when it becomes a bestseller, that it's completely changing its meaning, and then there are all these other layers of untranslability. Horrible word. And for example, you know, we can mention like uh, Khalid Hosseini and his Kite Runner or 1000 Raising Sound, which is like uh, praised by so many. But on the other hand, you know, how much Afghan is it? There's all the culture politics, you know, the emotional sort of approach to it because we feel for those people in Afghanistan who suffered. And we also know that perhaps the, you know, local Afghanis, they are not so well related to it. And also, you know, when I see like uh, Iranian movies or other stuff, it's very different language. There are silences, there are certain humbleness. So, you know, what about uh, sort of uh, translatability once when something becomes like a bestseller because the emotions are gone, silences are gone. The, the whole sort of culture alphabet is very, very different different, the language code is so different, so. Okay, that's a part of a larger question on translation, which is what kind of a translation are we talking about? You know, it goes back to Schleiermacher, the sort of the first philosopher of hermeneutics, who has a very interesting uh, notion of, um, Translatability, untranslatability. Okay, there are two ways of you can translate something. This is generally said. You know, the foreignizing translation in which you're translating, for example, Orhan Pamuk is translated like this. Orhan Pamuk already writes for an English audience. You know, it's already in advance. Yeah. Yeah. And and so it's it's for the English public to read it. The you know, it's actually a domestic Yes, right. Turkish, it's, yeah, people. Right. Yeah. See, he's he's a bestseller in, in the United States. He's not the best Turkish writer at all. There are much better writers. But he writes for an American audience or for a Western audience, if you want. When he's writing, is he's already thinking this is going to be a domesticating translation. Mm -hmm. So the domesticating translation is one written for the readers of the target language. And it reads as if it were already written in. English, in which case, of course, a lot of those idioms and, and, and pain or whatever is lost. And then, but, and then there's a foreignizing translation which keeps that, yeah. tries to keep it, tries to keep the original culture's idioms and tonalities and undercurrents, but that doesn't <laughs> sell because it's too foreign, mm -hmm. too foreign to read. I'm not quite sure if I'm answering your question, yeah, I was but more thinking about the interpretation and the understanding, like sort of translating self in the book and how much it can be trusted and if any authenticity is left or if it is becoming the cocktail, you know, that you heard yesterday from Rebecca Ugreshik, you know, which is a big question. You know. Yeah, but uh, look, I think it, it, whether you're self-translating or you're translating the work of or a, the culture or other people because he needs to relate to them and there's all the pain and meeting the expectations but 
how much is it authentic or true? But, but this is also what I was saying, you know, translation is never value free at all, you know. So you're translating and you're translating for a certain audience. You're changing the translation. Whether you self-translate or someone translates, I don't think there's that much of a difference if there's an agenda there. Uh, and, but there are certain things that are not quite translatable. And that's what I call, I use this irreducible untranslatability in a different context. For me, that meant you know, you're in a different culture, you speak the language very well, like Homi Baba once said, you know, we have become uncannily fluent in the other's languages. But the thing is, there's still many things that you can never express. That is the untrans irreducible untranslatability. And I always saw that as a marker of exile. You feel you are in exile then at that zone of untranslatability. I um so sorry, um I really liked the way you a analyzed Ozdemar, and I wanted to ask because I know in the Bridge of the Golden Horn, the second book that she published, uh, where she approaches Turkey from a different perspective, mm -hmm. I think. What did you think of that scene where uh, she's reading from Marx and she's on a donkey and she's talking to the women from the village about sexual liberation and how? What do you think about the sort of way she discusses Marxism in that book and sort of uh, translating it the other way around? Because you see, um, you know, you you see her writing in German and, and sort of uh, Turkishizing German and adding idioms, but at the same time, how does that sort of uh, work where she, when she brings, for instance, she's very intertextual, she talks about A Midsummer Night's Dream with the donkey, and then she has that donkey scene with Marx. The donkey so, lectures on Marx, yes. The donkey it's, also and then she eat, he eats the book. <laughs> so what, what did you think about Marxism in that particular scene? Well, I mean, her Marxism, and I use this term salsa, which of course originally meant, you know, mixing vegetables to, for a sauce. And then salsa also meaning uh, kind of a mixture of Hispanic music and then a dance. I think her Marxism is a kind of salsa. Actually, in, in Turkey, this is called arabesque. You know, so you take actually bits and pieces of explanations here. Her Marxism is an arabesque. I think people would basically call that an arabesque Marxism. You can dance to it or you cannot, you know. So uh, there is also, of course, like in every writer, there's a bit of a narcissism where she, she, it's a very smart, you know, she's very smart work where she also has a scene of, um, uh, Charlotte, uh, Charlotte Corday actually murdering Marat Saad in the, in the in the bathroom, and uh, so it's you know she brings in all of these things, but they're kind of uh, she never really makes an absolute statement with but any of a these things. Of, trans of translation in that scene, mm -hmm. there's a failure of communication with you know the the, the young. Kurdish women from that village, and mm -hmm. there's a sort of disconnect between her, you know, talking class politics to them and them talking back to them and sort of giving them something very unexpected. Well, exactly, but this is this has actually a kind of a pre prior model in Turkish literature where. Um, and she, she, of course, I mean, she. She is well read, and, and she, uh, both in both literatures, there's a model for this in, in, in um, Turkish literature where there has always been, this is almost a trope by now, that in, in Turkey and the Ottoman Empire before that and so on, there was an absolute division between the intellectuals and everyone else. You know, a complete division. Uh, so, so that, for example, during the so-called War of Independence, uh, the, the peasants sided with the Greek army and fought against their own, you know, because they really saw the intellectuals as like totally foreign, totally corrupt, totally everything, and, and, and sympathize with the quote unquote enemy. But this, uh, so, so there are books in which the same thing happens. You know, they're trying to tell, you, have you ever heard of Marx? Actually, a, a teacher asks a, a soldier, a common foot soldier, he says, oh, Marcus, are you talking about Marcus? Marcus used to be the old um, 
carpenter in our village. You know, so there's always this, uh, oh, you, you talk about markets. So there's always this thing, they can never quite actually, I mean, you can't start teaching Marx or saying anything about Marx to someone who's illiterate. Uh, so, uh, but, but there's a pattern, uh, uh, these scenes actually repeat themselves uh, in, in Turkish literature okay, before her, so. yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I loved your, your, your talk, it was Thank you. <laughs> actually an eye-opener, and, um, and I was just also wondering, on the one hand, translation seems to be liberating, particularly when... So, <laughs> Translation seems to be liberating, particularly when you consider it as a way of uh, evading censorship mm -hmm. and recuperating whatever was erased by censorship. But you also write for another audience. Is there a, a process of self-censorship when you write for the audience of your host country? Absolutely. This is, um, it's a very good question. Yes, there is a self-censorship. Uh, there's a self-censorship even in this translation. She can't just go so far, you know, and therefore, for example, in the Sosleben sign, the Kervan sign, when people read this book, it's very fascinating and so on, but there's a history she's hiding already. She tells a history of oppression as a fairy tale. That's already a form of self-censorship, even though she's writing in German. Writers do this. There's a very famous Turkish uh, humorous writer, Aziz Nesin. I don't know if anyone heard of him, but he he won a lot of. Uh, he died several years ago, and he he was also there was an assassination attempt on him because he was uh, his his um, his publisher was translating uh, Rushdie's Satanic Verses, and so. so but but that's kind of unrelated. But this this was a very famous humor writer, and he always self-censored because he spent more than half of his life in Turkish prisons, even though he was a brilliant writer, a comic writer. So he would write things like, um, and I have seen this in America too, like fairy tales for uh, grown-ups. So he would write actually uh, something, some really really grave political problem as some kind of a fairy tale. And that's also a form of self-censorship, yeah. 